Hi, this is Chi of Keller Williams Legacy Metropolitan. Uh, welcome to another episode of HGTV. Today, uh, I have a spe very special guest uh, sitting next to me, uh, Jennifer Robinson. She is the Executive Director of uh, Friends of Patterson Park. My face just went away. Um, and uh, today, we're going to talk uh, pretty much everything about what Friends at pa of Patterson Park does. Uh, how how they make uh, Patterson Park one of the best urban parks uh, in the country, if not, I think, the world. So um, if you have any questions at any point uh, it, that you want me to ask, uh, definitely put in the comments section below. be more than happy to answer them. But we'll, we'll cover a wide range of uh, topics, and hopefully you'll learn something, I learn something, to really uh, understand you know, all the things that we do in Patterson Park uh, you know, why, why it's a, such a popular park. So are you ready, Jennifer? I think I am. All right. You want to say hi, people? Hi. We're <laughs> attempting a double Facebook Live today, which is very exciting. So I'm going to say hello to our friends of Patterson Park viewers. Um, we hope there are a few of you out there and to Cheese, uh, HGTV fans. So <laughs> yes. welcome. I think we're ready. We'll find out. And uh, Martin Luther King Day, um, you know, uh, happy Martin Luther King Day. So uh, everyone who's... Um, you know, celebrating. He's a he's a great man, and um, you know we're we're not in country today without him. So, uh, all right. So let's let's go into it. Uh, Jennifer, uh, are you originally from Baltimore? I am not originally from Baltimore. She, um, I came to Baltimore actually in 1998 after serving in the Peace Corps, and I'm originally from Central Illinois. Um, and one of the things I like to think about Baltimore is it's like a really big, small town. I really love the, the small feel of the big city. So, nope, I'm happy to be here, though. Okay, great, great. And when did you move to Patterson Park? So I came in 1998 and actually ended up moving to Patterson Park in 2001. I bought my first home uh, through the Patterson Park CDC. And I learned about it. I studied public policy at Johns Hopkins as my graduate work. And I learned about what was being attempted, really, in Patterson Park and was interested in it. So came in 2001. Okay. All right. And I'm sure before that, uh, what school did you go to? Uh, um, undergrad. Undergrad? Uh, University okay. of Iowa. In Iowa. I okay. studied education. Education. And then studied public policy. In and I remember that you served in the Peace Corps, correct? I did, actually. I served in the Peace Corps in the Republic of Moldova in the mid-1990s. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think you, you recently went there last year, right? Yeah, I had the opportunity to take my family back um, to visit the village where I lived and see old friends, and it was really a great experience. Great. And what, what would you say you learned from that experience to transfer to what you're doing now? I think it's very similar in all the best ways. Um, I think in Peace Corps you learn that people are people pretty much everywhere you go, and you can find the good in things. And I think um, Peace Corps really encourages you to listen and learn and try to understand people's perspectives before you jump in and try to do things. And I think that's something that's important. In the park, I think one of the interesting things about Patterson Park is that we have, um, we're surrounded by residents and we're a big park. So people bring their own experiences of the park and what they like to do here. Um, so we're really trying to help make the park the best it can be for all the different types of users. So listening to those people, understanding different perspectives, um, and being willing to work and connect to partners is a really important thing that I learned. There's definitely many uh, different perspectives. So Absolutely. <laughs> what can be Absolutely. done. Absolutely. Well, that's great. Uh, we are in this uh, building, uh, as you call it, the White House. So tell us a little bit about this building that that people walk past by all the time, right? Yeah, actually, it's a really exciting place for us to be. We've been here since our inception, and we can talk a little bit about that. But the White House, as it's called, was not always white, from what I understand. So okay. that'd be an interesting thing to dig into in a future episode. Um, but it did serve as the park superintendent's house uh, for many, many years. It was built in the late 1860s, if you can believe it. Um, served as the park superintendent's home until, I guess, the 1970s, maybe even the early 80s. Um, so somebody was on site here in the park, and if something happened, they got a call, and they could go out and address whatever it was in the park. So having that kind of on-site management was really key for a long time in the city. Right, right. And uh, if you ever look into Patterson Park back in the day, they had a lot more, <laughs> I think, going on. Um, with uh, with the big bigger 
pond and everything else, right? Yeah, I think there were, and there were several actually buildings that right. have been lost over time. Right. So there was a lot of management required on the ground. One of the things that we're excited this year is we're starting to think about the ways that we can use this building to be a little bit more public serving. Mm -hmm. So we're doing some pre-design work on the White House and we're looking at whether we can make it into some sort of visitor center for the park and, and connecting to the fountain and the pagoda and people come into the park and they want to know what's going on here. Right. So if we can build that into a new space and maybe a little bit more community meeting space. We love to have community groups use the building. Um, committees, neighborhood associations, all kinds of things are really exciting. So um, we want to continue that trend and see what we can do about that in the future. That's fantastic. Can't wait. Uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, please like our video. And if you have any questions, please put, put it in the comment section below. We'd love to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Um, so how long have you been director of Friends? So I came to the director's position in 2013, about halfway through the year. So about three and a half years now. And I was on the board of directors before that and really learned about the different issues that we face as the Friends in the park and got involved in the conversation over parking in the park and understood the Friends role in that. Um, and that was a really good introduction to my work here as well. Great, great. Now, for people who doesn't know uh, what Friends of Patterson Park does, what, what do you guys do? Yeah, so I can share. So we have a mission to uh, ensure the park's vitality as a treasured green space and encourage use and, um, I can't read that next word, but use um, by and appreciation by neighbors, visitors, and future generations. And so um, we are not doing a lot of the things that you might think are directly linked to the park, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But one of the things that we've done over time is look at ways to program the park, um, look at ways to connect people to volunteer opportunities in the park. We know if people volunteer in the park, they feel more connected mm -hmm. and encouraged to engage in other issues. Um, we help think about things like when new uses are proposed, um, we come back to trying to make sure the park is serving as many different users as possible. So we look at maintaining as much green space as possible in the park. So that means um, sometimes we're in the position that's really tricky of saying, um, we know people would like to maybe make a permanent bocce court in the park, for example, but um, as cool as that might be, it means that that's a bocce court and it can't be used for other things. So we're always looking at how we can maintain spaces that could be a temporary bocce court, but then could be used for picnic space and people can walk their dogs and, um, you know, trying to maintain those different uses in the park. So we come down on that. And then we do programming events and stewardship teams. Okay. All right. So many different things that uh, I personally have been living in Passon Park since 2007. And like many of you, uh, I walk my kids there now, you know, playground yeah. and people play tennis. So. That's great. So there, there's might be some misconception of what Friends does. Yeah. Uh, Friends of Passion Park, uh, you guys don't cut the grass in the park, right? We do not cut the grass in the park. Um, and we work in close partnership with Baltimore City Recreation and Parks. And I think that's a key thing is that Patterson Park is a really great public park. And that's one of the real assets it has going for it. And so we really try to come in and support when we can um, what the city's not able to do. The city's budget is always limited, as we know, um, and stretched in many ways. And we're actually lucky in Baltimore City. We have a great network of parks. Um, we have incredible diversity in our parks across the city, um, but there aren't enough resources to program and make them all as great as they could be. So we try and supplement um, and come in where we can to provide things that the city can't provide. So the city actually has a mowing contract that they negotiate and maintain, and we feel like that's actually um, an okay thing, um, and we try to support that when we can, certainly. Okay. All right. And the city, uh, they, they also take care of the, the pool. And That's the dog, right. And the right. Dog park also. So the park does host many city facilities um, that we do not directly run. Um, so there's a recreation center, um, the ice rink, um, and we there's a dog park as well. Um, so we again try to support where we can. We try to make connections. We try to help with communications as we can be helpful. Um, but we do not run those. One of the things we like to do though is help connect people, for example, to the recreation center for additional programming. So we support some of the programming that happens in the rec center for free. Um, all of our programming at the Friends of Patterson Park is provided for free, oh. and that's part of our core mission. Um, so we're always trying to look at how we can support and maybe enhance the, the offerings that are available, maybe get more people into the recreation center mm -hmm. um, using that building. Um, those kinds of things are part of our function. Uh, it's, it's a great space if you've never been there. So actually I was looking and I, I think we see uh, <laughs> someone um, 
yeah. at some point speak to lighting issues? I can speak to the lighting okay. issues. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, one, if you, she's asking, I think, Taryn, Taryn, Taryn sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, the lighting. So it's actually interesting. We have a new master plan for the park, and this is one of the questions we get all of the time is why is the park not better lit? Um, so... I wish I had a really easy answer for you. The long and the short of it is that the current lighting in the park relies on copper wiring, um, and many of the lights have had that copper wiring stolen repeatedly. Um, and that's an example of where the Friends has worked in partnership with the city. So there were several, my predecessors worked in partnership to try and problem solve how to keep the copper wire from being stolen. We moved the copper wire from the bottom of the fixture to the top of the fixture. We um, tried using a foam that kept people out. We've tried different locking mechanisms. There've been a lot of different attempts to keep that wire from being stolen. And actually in the new master plan, the, the number one priority is to get a new lighting plan for the park. Um, and we're trying to build that um, setting into it so that we can um, understand our options. I think people bring up solar a lot. We're trying to figure out if there's a solar option that doesn't have copper wiring in it. Um, so that's one of the things we're really working on is trying to figure out um, what's a sustainable solution. Obviously, copper wiring is very expensive and the city has limited resources, so they're not willing to necessarily commit a lot of funds to fixing it until we make it sustainable. Um, so actually, it's the number one priority. I want to say thank you to our legislators legislative team. We have money from Program Open Space from the last session, which is really great news. Um, and that is actually the number one priority is a lighting plan. So we hear people when they talk about that. We see it as really connected to safety um, and other issues and in just basic enjoyment of the park. So it's yes. something that we're working on, um, but we need a solution that is going to be sustainable over time. Unfortunately, copper is uh, it, it's, uh, it's worth something. So <laughs> people commodity. have yes, to... <laughs> yes. Um, well, thank you. Thank, if, yeah, again, so again, and you know, yeah. um, you can always email me at jennifer at pattersonpark.com if you want to follow up on a particular comment too. All right. Well, thank you for asking uh, the question. This is, again, uh, it's, it's <laughs> Facebook Live, so this is as real as it gets. So if you have any other questions, please uh, type in there in the comment section below uh, and we'll answer them. Yeah. Uh, we'll continue with our, my, my questions with Jennifer. So. Um, let's give a little brief history of Patterson sure. Park, okay? So, right. how to start? Well, so the interesting thing is that the land obviously has been here for a long time, and we have some things. We can do a whole other episode oh, on yeah, the history I'm of Patterson sure. Park. I am not going to cover it all today, <laughs> no, and I'm no, not no, a historian, no, no. so I just will say that up front. Uh -huh. um, I've learned a tremendous amount about the park's history in mm -hmm. my job, and that's been really exciting for me, actually. Um, in 2014, we had a big celebration of the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Baltimore mm -hmm. from the War of 1812, and so I had the opportunity to get to know the his historical community kind of around here and, and understand people who are thinking about it. Um, but William Patterson is where the name comes for Patterson Park, and it has had lots of other names. So you'll hear it called Hampstead Hill. Um, the Rogers Bastion was another name that comes up in the War of oh, 1812. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, but it started from William Patterson, who was an Irish immigrant businessman who donated six acres of land, if you can believe it. The total park size now is 136 acres, or right thereabouts. Um, and so six acres became many more over time, but 1827 is when that was um, officially donated. Um, but there were things happening in the park before that, obviously the Battle of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, we had a cool archaeological dig in the park in 2014, sponsored oh. by Baltimore Heritage, which was really cool. And we got to see them digging and understanding the layers of history. And they found arrowheads and things going back um, much further than oh, 1812. Wow. Um, okay. So it's exciting. And I will preview for you on Facebook Live that we will have our case in the base of the pagoda filled with some of those artifacts from that dig uh, this season. So when okay. the pagoda opens, you'll be able to see some of that and understand the history. They found the, the butcher's house that gave Butcher's Hill its name. Oh, wow. Um, and the base of that, obviously, and some of the bottles and things. So it's really exciting that we're going to get to share that with visitors to the pagoda. Um, but then over time, um, the park was really designated as public land, um, but a lot of things kind of got in the way from it becoming a fully fledged and utilized public park. Um, the land that we're on right now was actually part of a Civil War hospital camp for the Union Army during the Civil War. So that's really exciting history yeah. as well and another area that we can dive into. And, and, and a lot of these things Jen is talking about, we'll actually do separate shows. And <laughs> it's too much to cover. A lot of cover, but uh, we'll, we'll, you know, our plan is to really uh, give out more, more information, history, content on future uh, yeah. episodes. 
Uh, so that we'll do a whole episode of the pagoda, yeah, uh, and, and the fountain, you know. And well, and one of the things that I think you know, kind of an easy way to sum it up, the pagoda was built in 1891 and dedicated in 1892, and it's really designed to commemorate a lot of the history that happened in that space. Mm -hmm. um, so Rogers Bastion, a lot of the War of 1812 things. So you can view the history, you know, the pagoda is now a new piece of history, but it was really designed to um, commemorate all the history that had already taken place and then all the history that's gone on that. So um, that is one of the roles that we play at the Friends is we work with funders to try to find funds to um, enhance the historical aspects of the park. Um, so we play a role in maintaining and opening the pagoda. Um, we are working to get the fountain running. Um, the fountain itself is working. We are struggling a little bit with underground water issues. Um, and so we're trying to get that up and running consistently. But that's the oldest remaining architectural element in the park from 1862. So that's really exciting. Wow, well. 1862, the fountain. Yeah. Never knew that. Yeah. So, well, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's fantastic. So um, I believe you told me there was a master plan uh, back yeah. in 1988. 98. 98, okay. Mm -hmm. And to tell us a little bit more how it's from the transition before that to... to sure. To um, and so the exciting thing is we have a new master plan, but really that 1998 master plan is part of the inspiration for the Friends. And it was really an opportunity, I think as with any master planning, to try and get a holistic view of the park and its setting and its uses and what people are experiencing. And the park was a very different place in 1998. And so... Um, to have the opportunity to emerge from that and participate in a new process is actually really exciting. So mm -hmm. the 1998 master plan actually um, is partially responsible for the pagoda getting rehabbed. And it was a lot of community members um, in the surrounding communities. Thank you for Yes, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, they are our, our you know, founders, <laughs> many of them actually, and still engaged in the park. So we do say thank you. But they really put pressure on prioritizing renovating the pagoda as a capital project. Um, the pagoda had fallen into great disrepair. Mm. Um, pigeons were living in it. It had construction fencing around it. Um, it was not really an asset at all to the neighborhood, I would say. You can't at go that inside and visit. I, I, no. um, you, can't, you, you could if you wanted to <laughs> do it, probably not in the safest way possible. Gotcha. But, um, and so that group of residents really came together to get it through the master plan on the city's radar as a capital project. Um, it did get finished um, by the city and those community members, lots of volunteer time went into digging out pigeon droppings and other things. Um, so it really was a great effort between the city and local residents. And um, the interesting thing is a lot of people know is that it can be easier to find money to fix a building. Um, that's something that lasts over time. Um, the problem with that at the time was that the capital money didn't come with any operating money. So it was celebrated in 2002, opened, People wanted to start bringing people to it. There was an interest in the pagoda again as an asset to the community, mm -hmm. um, certainly you know real and potential. Um, and yet there wasn't that operating money to make that happen. And so that's really kind of one of the key roles that the Friends was able to play at the beginning was bringing in the support. Um, we have an amazing team to this day of pagoda docents who are there to open the pagoda to the public, answer questions, make sure it's a good experience for them. Um, but that's the kind of partnership where if we can have the capital investment and then we can come in and operationally support that, it, it really does help. And so we still open the pagoda every Sunday um, during the season, which is mid-April to mid-October. Mm -hmm. um, last year, the pagoda had more than 10,000 visitors wow. um, come through. They come through from all over the world, which is really cool. Um, and an asset, we see lots of local folks. Um, we're actually looking forward in 2017. Um, Leslie Gardner was on here, um, and we, she and I are working, we're on, working on a plan um, to see if we can open it even more. So we'd like to add some more open days. It's open every Sunday and special events. Um, um, Concerts. So concerts, mm -hmm. yes, all those things. It's already open. We'd like to add a few more days, get a few more visitors in there. So it's really exciting. And I want to say thank you um, to all the Pagoda docents who do such a great job opening it. To the yes, public. thank you. Yes. Uh, I take my kids there when it's open. It's, yeah. it's a great, great view. Yeah, it folks. is. It's best view in Baltimore. I and, think. and so some say it might, might be the most photographed. Uh, some be... people are saying <laughs> it may be the most photographed icon in Baltimore City. I've heard that before and we would we believe that's true. So we, maybe we... we'll work on making that uh, official this year. Yes, yes. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great landmark and uh, definitely if you've never been to Patterson Park, definitely come check it out. Uh, it's one of the great buildings that we have here in Baltimore. Absolutely. Um, so who, who designed it? 
that the Bogota? Actually, it was designed by Charles Latrobe. I know this one. Um, and the Latrobe family had a great history in Baltimore. Um, his uncle, let's see, his uncle, Benjamin, designed the first U.S. Capitol building um, in Washington, D.C., and a long history. Um, and the other cool thing about Patterson Park for parky kind of folks is you may have heard of the Olmsted Brothers um, or Olmsted Park. Central Park is the most famous Olmsted Park, but okay. we are also in Olmsted Park. Um, several parks in Baltimore are, and it's really cool. You can see the influence of the Olmsted brothers who designed kind of the combination of the western half of the park being a little more relaxing, a little more pastoral, um, and the eastern side being the active core. Um, that's where the ice rink and the tennis courts and those things. So having that combination of uses within the park is something that directly resulted from the Olmsted brothers' um, work here. So it's very exciting. Fantastic, and we'll we'll dive in a little bit more yeah. too on, on uh, another show. We can talk about history. Yes, uh, for, <laughs> forever. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, the the events and and things that uh -huh. uh, happens in there. So I think you told me before there's a. It's not a luxury, it's a, you try and promote health programs within the park, right? Yeah, actually, right. So one of the cool things that we have a history of doing over time, um, Tim Almaguer, who's my predecessor, um, started some great work with soccer in the park. So we do free soccer programs for kids four and up. Um, it's something we're committed to making sure as more for-profit companies come in and are doing programming in the park, which is great. We just want to make sure that balance is maintained and that there are free programs that everybody can access. Um, yeah, so we do a lot more on health and we really see, I think there's some other park folks um, talking about parks are really rec centers, you know, this kind of divide between a building where you go to do recreation, but thinking of the whole park as that opportunity. And so we really believe that too. Um, we have a great program director who does a lot of health um, programming. So we have uh, walking and running groups. Mm -hmm. We do a festival in the fall called Muy Vetan or Move, Move It On, uh, and that has a free 5K. So a lot of people would like to maybe try training for a 5K, but all 5Ks generally have a registration cost, or a lot of them do. Um, so we have figured out a way to do a free 5K so that maybe people can try something out and have a goal. Um, we do tennis programming for kids, and the last couple of years we've done tennis programming for adults as mm -hmm. well. Um, we heard there was an interest in maybe having more people that hadn't had the opportunity to learn to play tennis use our tennis courts. And so we can play the role of permitting those, hiring an instructor, you know, setting up something for kids to do. We do simultaneous programming, which means that when we do something for kids, we try to do something for adults next door to it. So if we have soccer for kids, we also have Zumba next door. So the whole family can come out, mm -hmm. drop the kids at soccer, mom gets a workout, or dad, we love when dads participate. <laughs> dads and moms can get a workout at Zumba right next door while they can see their kids playing soccer. The whole family gets a workout. It kind of sets an example. That's a model that we try to use is having different things going on for different members of the family inside the park. So that's really exciting. Um, Let's see, what else do we do? This winter, we still have Zumba in the rec center for free, which is exciting. If you like our page, you'll get updates on that. Um, and all these information's in your... In your uh, yeah, Facebook is a great place to keep up to date on these something. things as well. Yep. Okay. Um, and how many concerts are there? There are seven <coughs> concerts each summer on Pagoda Hill. We try and do a diverse set of artists, um, mm -hmm. make it family friendly maybe, um, but try to have artists and music that's going to appeal to a wide range of folks. Um, we know people come out for different reasons. This year we're looking at a, a couple new enhancements okay. to the concert area that we'll talk about in the future. <laughs> I don't want to give it all away today, but Pile we're excited about it. Oh, no, like, no, uh, no. Something like that. No, no maybe. Um, mm, we'll consider okay, that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and let's see here. Um, so anything coming up this year that, uh, that's exciting that, uh, you want people to know about? It is all exciting. All exciting. That's, <laughs> that's what we want people to know. Um, no, actually we're going to kick off our season. Um, we do a big Earth Day stewardship event. So we have volunteer opportunities. We invite people to try one of our volunteer teams, which meet monthly normally, but then we kind of stack them on our Earth Day celebration. Um, the Pagoda opens the following week and we will have that new case. Um, with the artifacts that we encourage people to come out and see. The concerts are going to be better than ever. Um, we're looking ahead to our wine tasting fundraiser, um, which always happens very the popular. Thursday. It's very popular the Thursday <laughs> before some reason, Memorial Day weekend. Why. I know people like to drink wine in the park <laughs> for a good cause. Mm -hmm. um, and our Pagoda Lighting event, we want to mention that we're really thinking about ways that we can connect and keep building our Pagoda Lighting event. We have a huge turnout every year. We had 1,500 people easily this year. Wow. Um, come see 
see us light the pagoda. We had Santa on a fire truck. We had lots of different things. So that was exciting. Um, and we're trying to build on that. We always have a few tricks up our sleeves, so we don't mm -hmm. want to um, give it all away, but please stay okay. tuned and come out to the park. If you have an idea, that's the other thing I'll say is if somebody has an idea out there and like, why don't you do this? I'm happy to either figure out how we do it, um, connect you with somebody that may want to do it, let you know if it's already happening, um, those kinds of things. So we're always open to new ideas right. um, and ways that we can work with people. Actually, I'm going to work that into it. So how, how can people help friends uh, of Passion Park? Well, one of the key things is to become a member or a friend of the park um, by making a donation. Um, that's mm -hmm. probably the key way that we. And love how much is it per have, year at minimum? Um, we have a lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. It really starts at twenty five dollars a year. Only twenty five dollars. Only twenty five dollars, or or more. or or more if you would like to get involved <laughs> at a different level. Um, but then really, I think um, getting engaged in one of our teams, coming out to our programming, um, volunteering, finding ways to connect, come to the Pagoda, um, share it with your friends, let people know how proud you are of your park. And there are lots of different ways, but they're, everybody's going to find their own way, and we're tr happy to try and support that as well. So, yeah. Well, friends, I, I think uh, we use the park all the time, and I think one of the – you volunteer, but to become a member, that, uh, that goes a long way. It really does. Um, Money. I will say our, our members give in the range of $80,000 a year, oh, okay. um, so it's great. So people are very generous. We want to say thank you to them. Thank you. Um, we have support from local businesses as well, um, but we can't do what we do without that kind of support. So exactly. thank you to everybody who's already a member. Um, you can give monthly, which is actually really cool. We have people who give a few dollars every month, and oh, wow. it all does make a difference. Okay, definitely, definitely. Well, um, let's let's go down to one of the most talk about topics: uh, <laughs> <laughs> trash cans. Uh, if you're waiting for for trash can info, so tell us uh, what's the, the latest uh, yeah. new information about the new trash cans that everyone wants to have. Well, okay. I would say in addition to lighting. So when we're not talking right. about lighting, all right, we are talking about trash, trash cans, cans with people. So we we um, we hear it all the time, and as I mentioned when we did our campaign. We have a lot of the oil drum trash cans, mm -hmm. and the challenge with those is really that they move around. Um, they, because people move them. Because people physically move them. Sometimes they end Just... up in the boat lake. We're not sure how that happens. <laughs> but um, we, we know they're not a stable resource for people. And one of the solutions that we know is of interest is having installed trash cans that are actually drilled into the ground. Um, that are at entrance points to the park. And that really lets people who are walking their dogs, for example, know there's going to be a trash can in place that they can use and they're not questioning where they're going to find one. Um, so this past fall, we raised $12,000 to match funding from a grant where we have money you. from BGE, which we want to say thank you to. Mm -hmm. um, we also have an individual donor who's given to trash cans, and most of the installed trash cans that you already see in the park are thanks to her donations. Um, so we put together a pot of money, and we're getting ready uh, to order our trash cans. We have to find a contractor who can install the, the concrete pads because our the contractor we had talked to to get our estimate um, is not no longer available. Available, so we'll be looking for that. Um, but as soon as possible, we'll have 20 new installed trash cans in the park, which is really exciting, um, thanks to donations. Um, and it's the start we hope to test out of how how we can continue to enhance that. And what the, we don't know what the right number of trash cans is yet. We mm -hmm. think that's a start. Um, but we're really excited to see how that will impact it. I will say, too, that one of the things we're actually working with the trash can manufacturer on is how we solve the problem of the bags going underneath the liner of the trash can. And so we're we're trying to figure out if there's a better system for that. We know that's one of the things that can happen is the bags can fall through the bottom. So those are the kinds of things that we are um, actively working on and trying to address um, to make the park I think Jennifer became a trash expert. I know. <laughs> I didn't anticipate coming to this job that I would know quite so much about trash cans. Engineering of the trash cans, I, how trash can hold in I the trash can. I know more than <laughs> I may should. want to, yes. Um, no, but we are working on it. And it, we understand that those are the types of issues that really impact people's experience in the park. And so if we can help impact that, um, those trash cans, as we talked about when we were doing the campaign, they cost $1,000 a piece. 
Um, and so it's something that we wish the city had the resources. If I could fund the Rec and Parks to have them enough to put them in, um, I would do that. But certainly it's a, it's a resource that we just can't expect the city to be able to provide at the level um, we'd like them to with their current funding. So we are stepping that's in. thousand dollars just basically the trash can or the actual That is right. Also? No, the uh, just the trash can costs just about a thousand dollars. So then you have to have a concrete pad poured. We have to get those trash cans delivered, all of those things. So that's the total package. So people are always surprised. They are great trash cans. They will last probably 20, um, 25 years at a minimum, okay. um, but they're expensive. So make your donations well we, we, we have the money <laughs> for the money. trash cans we will always take more money and if you yes. give us a donation and say it's for trash cans um we will honor that um certainly but yes we we are very pleased and appreciative of all the donors who gave money for trash cans well hopefully that answers uh, a lot of uh, your questions about trash cans and uh, what friends does uh of patterson park um I, I, one last thing. Actually, you want to show uh, our viewers some of the... Oh, sure. Some of our stuff. So stuff. if you join at a certain level um, on our website, we have a cool book that talks about the history of Patterson Park that we will um, send to you. We also started uh, encouraging folks to have reusable glasses. This is a glass that looks like a solo cup, but it is um, great. And it, it may or may not fit an entire can of beer in it. Okay. Um, if, if I don't it were. know. So we don't know, but <laughs> it's been tested. and we've I'm sure someone rumors. will test it. Um, and it comes with a lid. It's great for hot or cold. We have these available um, at some of our special events um, or at our office. We have Pagoda Cookie Cutters, um, which are always a hit. We have a beautiful new... 2017 calendar we did a photo contest last year for the yes. first time and we had amazing entrances we had hundreds of photos entered in the contest and the winners are in this um calendar oh, wow. um so that's an exciting thing we have more stuff maybe next time we'll do yeah, next time. a little uh, shopping at the friends okay episode but um excited to share that with folks so uh, if you've been watching uh there jennifer would like to give uh, one of these uh products away yeah absolutely watcher so the question for the per first person who answered this uh, question correctly will get what, what? What will they get, Jennifer? They are going to get two, not one, but two of these amazing cups to use in the park, um, and a pagoda cookie cutter and a calendar. Oh wow! For your you dining can, and cooking and you can put that calendar in yes. your office. Absolutely, uh, <laughs> it makes a great anywhere. gift. All right. So the question is: <laughs> How many new trash cans are going to be installed in Passon Park? So that is question. Uh, if you if you're the first person to answer correctly, you will get all those great uh, Pass and Park items. So two two coffee cups or or beer cups, whatever you <laughs> you want in there. Cookie cutter and calendar. All right. Um, well, I think this is this is fantastic. Thank you for being here, Chi. We really love when people take an interest in the park. We know um, our real estate community is actually a really key partner for us. So thank you for taking an interest in our work. Right. Um, and we love to see how the park and the neighborhoods play together. So it's great to talk to you. Great, great. Thank you so much. And again, uh, if you're just joining us, if you have anything that you want to learn about uh, Patterson Park, just put in the comment section below. We'll definitely do another uh, segment or show about that. And thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Uh, we'll see you, see you later. soon. All right. All right. Bye-bye.